Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, April 18th. This is Deacon Barry Taylor, and our we are in Lesson 7, Unit 1, which is entitled Prophets of Restoration, Prophets of Restoration, from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Our lesson title is initiating renewal initiating renewal our devotional reading is taken from daniel chapter 9 verses 4 to 6 and verses 15 to 19 our background scripture is taken from nehemiah chapter 2 verses 11 to 20 and then 13 chapter 13 verses 1 to 22 and our printed And lesson passage is taken from Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 11 to 20. Our key verse uh, from the NIV is, I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. And that is Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. From the quarterly, the lesson aims or number one, examine why Nehemiah decided to restore the walls of Jerusalem and reform or revive the Sabbath law. Number two, appreciate Nehemiah's feeling, feelings rather, and behavior in restoring the wall and reforming Jewish worship. And then number three, identify ways to restore worn parts of the faith community and revive traditions that honor God. A couple of those aims, I believe, go beyond our lesson today. Uh, but we will uh, we will focus on uh, the lesson text and and, uh, and and the understanding of it as best we can. After the introduction, the lesson outline has three divisions. The first is entitled "Reviewing the Situation." That's covered between Nehemiah chapter two verses eleven and sixteen to sixteen. The second is challenging the people. That's covered between chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And the third is renouncing opposition. Renouncing opposition. That's covered between chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. From the standard commentary, the lesson title is The Restoring Builder. The Restoring Builder. Um, and additional aims are very quickly summarize the results of Nehemiah's nighttime excursion around Jerusalem. Number two, explain why faith in the Lord and careful planning are not necessarily contradictory. And number three, prepare a testimony of how God's hand has been at work in his or her life, that is, in your life. We're going to give a little background here. Um, For those that are familiar with the return of those who had been exiled to the books that cover the return of those who had been exiled to Babylon, uh, those being uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, that return began at the, the command of Cyrus, who was uh, king of Persia, uh, and uh, when they overthrew, when Persia overthrew Babylon, and he actually commanded, this had been prophesied by Isaiah hundreds of years before, uh, that they re- that they be allowed to return in 539 B.C. I'm sorry, 538 B.C. as a rubble led some 50,000 uh Jews back to uh, Judah and Jerusalem to build a temple. Uh, That was followed by Ezra, 
who led the second group back in 558 BC, some 80 years later, and then followed, and he was followed by Nehemiah, who came to be a civil leader. Ezra, as we read last week, was um, a scribe and a priest, and he came to restore uh, re religious uh, the the obedience to God's law. You remember he found that a number of the men, including the priests and the nobles and the Levites, had married, intermarried and had children by the heathen, and they were practicing uh, abominations, uh, idolatry. Uh, and he actually led to uh, those men cleaning up their act, if you will. Uh, but the third... Uh, the third leader, if you will, was Nehemiah, who came to Jerusalem in five, I'm sorry, 445 BC, uh, primarily as a civil leader. And he had been uh, the king's cupbearer, King Artaxerxes. And the events of our lesson today happened in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, who was the stepson of uh, Queen Esther. And, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the son of Darius, who was the son of Cyrus. Now, or the, 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 of, of the uh, successor of Cyrus. Now, um, he had uh, not been to Jerusalem or Judah, but had heard about the sorry state that uh, the city was in from his brother who returned from a trip there. Uh, the walls were still uh, torn down and burned. The gates were burned. And this was some uh, decades. Uh, this had been some uh, more than 100 years since uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, laid siege to Jerusalem in 586 B.C., and actually uh, leveled it, leveled the temple, the walls, the principal palaces, and so forth. And so the city was uh, defenseless. It was in ruins still, even though the temple, uh, which was kind of a shadow of the temple that Solomon had built, had been rebuilt. Uh, the city was just wide open, uh, and, and it was there was rubble every place. So Nehemiah was really... Um, uh, this he was disheartened by this news, and he appeared before the king uh, with a uh, sad countenance that the king was able to to notice. And read about this earlier in uh, read the first uh, ten verses of chapter two. So the king questioned him. You know, hey, here's this cupbearer, and he's not looking too happy. Better find out what's going on. And Nehemiah whispered a prayer to God, and God guided him in how to respond to the king. He told him what was going on in his native land and how um, he really uh, um, was distressed by that. And the king said, well, what would you have me to do? He prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, and, and he asked for papers to, grant, to get him a passage there. He asked for materials and and, and authority to be the civil governor and so forth. And Artaxerxes granted him all this, and he gave him a time that he expected to return uh, and uh, and set out. So he came when he came. Our lesson picks up after he gets to Jerusalem, at least some three days after he arrives. Uh, and uh, he's been traveling some 1,100 miles, uh, and it's taken about three months so he's rested up probably for three days after that long journey. Uh, and then our, that's where our lesson text picks up. So we're going to have a uh, brief word of prayer, and then we will get into our lesson text verse by verse. So, Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. Lord God, we thank you for the example that we find in Nehemiah in um, faithful uh, leadership, Lord, the importance of, of strategic planning, but more important, Lord, the uh, importance of uh, diligence and prayer and dependence on you, Lord, to provide uh, everything we need, to provide the guidance that we need 
to ensure the success of every endeavor that we undertake for your glory, Lord. Uh, we thank you for those who are listening. We pray for their understanding. And Lord, we pray again, uh, as always, Lord, as we understand your word, our faith would be increased. And as our faith is increased, our obedient to your clear uh, doctrine, Lord, and to the examples in your word would be increased. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to back up just a little bit uh, and read a bit of the uh, biblical context from the quarterly, which I thought was uh, was very clear and uh, I think summarized uh, our lesson and actually the book of Nehemiah uh, very well. He said the book is a first-person account of Nehemiah's memoirs and highlights uh his unquestioning obedience to God. Nehemiah's commitment to prayer was foundational to his success in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem despite external opposition and setbacks. The first seven chapters of the book are devoted to events surrounding the actual rebuilding of the walls. The remaining chapters uh, are a record of his efforts to restore the spiritual lives of the people. And we won't get into that, but if we read beyond our lesson text uh, and got into chapter four and beyond, we would read how uh, people were trafficking on the Sabbath in all kinds of ways. And Nehemiah put an end to that. Nehemiah's dependence on prayer and his godly life and extraordinary leadership make him a worthy example for believers in every generation. He is an example for leadership. And uh, and I, I hope that all us who are in any kind of capacity where we lead or where we are to set an example for others will use him as a faithful example. So we're gonna, we're gonna first uh, go by this uh, division by division, I think, uh, uh, from the adult quarterly, uh, the first division, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is entitled Reviewing the Situation, and that's covered between verses 11 and 16 of chapter 2, and I'm going to read uh, the entire passage, and then we'll back up. Um, from the NIV, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, verse 12, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding. By night, I went up through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Verse 14. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall, finally turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet, I said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Okay, all right. So let's let's back up here to verse 11. He said, so I came to Jerusalem uh, and was there three days. Now, um, he perhaps could have been doing some planning during the three days, but... As I said earlier, he had traveled uh, some 1,100 miles from Susa, which was the capital city of the Persian Empire, to Jerusalem, and no doubt needed that three days to rest up. After the three days, however, verse 12 says, uh, he arose, he said, and I arose in the night. Okay, what was the significance of that? Well, he obviously wanted to do uh, some inspection uh, without being seen, in secret, as it were. 
Uh, and so he does this by night. He, him, he said, I and some few men with me. He, he didn't uh, invite a large crowd. He wanted to keep his investigation, the purpose for him being there, secret. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me or any mount, any animal, any mule or, or horse, whatever he was on, or a camel, if you will, save except the beast that I rode upon. Now, uh, that was from the King James Version, by the way. Uh, he, um, he goes out by night because, again, he does not want to arouse any suspicion as to his purpose for being there. No one knows perhaps who he is or the authority that he has from Artaxerxes to actually come in and be the civil leader and actually the authority that he has to marshal the materials and so forth to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. That's his stated mission. So he needs to do some planning. And, and as we, we said earlier uh, in the introduction, uh, careful planning does not have to contradict with uh, trust in God. In fact, uh, God is the ultimate planner, you know, and certainly God gives wisdom and guidance in our planning. So he wants the first survey. He's heard from his brother and perhaps others the, the, the condition, a sorry condition of the walls, but he wants to see firsthand for himself and, es and make a, an estimation of the uh, extent of the work that's going to be required to restore the walls and the gates. Now, uh, don't think they were leveled entirely uh there were breaches certainly many breaches in the walls with that where it was uh where actually i guess nebuchadnezzar's troops came through gates of course were destroyed and burned so, but there was a lot of rubble a lot of uh and, and we'll understand that better as we go through um the next few verses so verse 13 says by night and it went and it, and it gives some details. He said, by night, and I went through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Now, the details of the gates don't necessarily uh, mean a whole lot to us not being familiar with Jerusalem. I have a Bible I'm looking at right now that actually has a layout of the gates around, uh, I'm sorry, the wall around Jerusalem and has those gates uh, identified here. However, uh, the, the major takeaway here as we go through this in the next verse or two is that he does a thorough in, in examination of the condition of the wall. He goes around the entire perimeter of Jerusalem and examines the wall, okay, so that he can assess the damage and the work that has to be done. And remember, he's requested uh, materials and so forth uh, that the king provide for the materials, and God, of course, moved and moved on the king and had him uh, agree to providing everything that Nehemiah had requested of him. That was part of the good hand of God that was upon Nehemiah. Now then, um, verse 14 goes on to say, Then I moved toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mouth. Now, one of the commentators, the standard commentator, gets into a lot of uh, detail about these particular gates and locations in the fountain gate and that perhaps being uh, close to the pool of Siloam and so forth. But... As I said, those details are uh, perhaps lost on those of us who are not familiar with Jerusalem and are not looking at a map showing uh, the perimeter, the, the wall perimeter of the city. Again, the important thing is the condition that he is assessing. And when he, he says here, he gets to a point 
where there's not enough room for his mount to get through, there's too much rubble, too much rock or whatever that's blocking the path. Uh, he can't get through. He's on a, a mule, perhaps, and he or donkey, and he can't get through. Verse 15 says, so I went up. He bypasses the rubble. I went up by the valley. I'm sorry, up the valley, rather, by night. This was the Ketron Valley, uh, examining the wall. Uh, finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. So what's it saying? He goes completely around, and then he turns back and retraces his path back the way he came, and he does a thorough survey of the wall of Jerusalem. For what purpose again? To assess the damage and determine how much effort the repair, uh, what's going to be needed to repair the breaches in the wall. Okay. Now we should we should uh, mention that again. He does this without telling anyone of what the Lord had put on his heart to do. He's probably been thinking about how he's going to marshal forces and how he's going to do things uh, since he left Susa. Uh, and certainly as he is going around and assessing the damage, the Lord is putting on his heart a plan of action for how to deal with uh, the repairs. And that is what, again, good leaders should do. They should do thoughtful planning, prayerful planning before speaking even to other leaders or others that uh, will uh, need to provide buy-in uh, on a project, whatever it is. I've been involved in several major church projects, and it's certainly important to get the buy-in of certainly the church leadership, the pastor, uh, other officials, the boards, but certainly the congregation as well. And we've uh, restored sanctuaries. We've put in elevators. We've done things that I think we uh, have been successful in because we've had buy-in of uh, the congregation and leadership. Verse 16 says, The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or priests, or nobles, or officials, or any others who would be doing the work. So there, there are no officials with him. He's got some guys, perhaps people that uh, have lived there and, and, and can show him around, uh, people that are, uh, and maybe some that counsel that have come with him, some wise counselors that have come with him, but he's not involved, the local priests and nobles and officials, and the workmen, those who are actually going to be uh, involved in actually doing the work to this point. He's, he's still planning. Now, moving into our second division, which is entitled Challenging the People. That's covered between chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. From the NIV again, it reads, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be a disgrace. Verse 18 says, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. So the first thing Nehemiah does is he um, reminds, not that they didn't know, certainly, but uh, he reminds the leaders, the officials, the nobles, uh, and others of the distressful situation that Jerusalem was in. Sometimes... We can be in ruins and we become so accustomed to them, we just don't realize that we're in ruins and, and the sorry state of affairs uh, we've uh, allowed ourselves to, uh, to come to. So he's coming in, fresh eyes, and he is, and, and this is really looking stark. I find myself um, 
I guess being a little surprised when people that grew up here in St. Louis come back. They've been away for years, decades, and they've lived in other parts of the country, and they come back and they go to some uh, deteriorated deteriorated area of the city, perhaps, and they say, man, it really looks bad, you know, uh, because <laughs> obviously uh, things were in better condition when they left, and uh, when they come back and they see how things have deteriorated, uh, it's stark. It's stark to them. We we drive by those neighborhoods every day and 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 don't really notice. Uh, but so so he is reminding them of the distressful situation Jerusalem is in. This was this was the city of the great king, the king of kings, and and lord of lords placed his name there, placed the temple there, the beautiful temple that Solomon has built. This was the the jewel, the glory. Uh, of God was to be reflected in that city. And so he's, and it's in ruins now. And he's saying, Jerusalem lieth waste, uh, uh, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. This this was uh, atrocious. He says, come, let us build up the walls of Jerusalem. This is his exhortation to the leaders now. Uh, that we be no more a reproach. Now, he is not appealing to them on the basis of the defense that a wall will afford them, will provide them, but he's basically dealing with them uh, on the basis of the communal disgrace that the condition of Jerusalem and the walls uh, uh, is, is, uh, is causing Okay, uh, now, as you know, uh, ancient cities uh, were really not regarded cities unless they were defensible. And ideally, there were, there were three um, conditions that uh, uh, city planners, if you will, or, or peoples look for when, when planning a city or locating a city. You know, the, 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 the first was access to water. Certainly, they needed fresh water, access to trade, number two, uh, and trade routes. Uh, and then third was defensibility. You know, a great city needed all three of those, and Jerusalem had had all three of those. However, uh, it was completely vulnerable now, was not defensible, and it was a disgrace in the ancient world for a city to be without walls. They knew that as well as Nehemiah did. Now, Nehemiah didn't stop at that. He didn't stop at, you know, just uh, reminding them of the, the horrible condition the city was in. He told them, verse 18 says, of the hand of my God. He said, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. In other words, uh, he's on a mission from God. He tells him, I'm on a mission from God, and God is going to bless this work. He's already done that in influencing the king, or moving in the king's heart to make the provisions that he has done. And, uh, and again, read uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, and you can read about what Nehemiah asked for, and, then, and the king granted them, granted all of it. Uh, and uh, so the gracious hand of God was going to be at work with them in rebuilding the wall. And so they they get excited now. Okay, this is a project of God. If God is in this, then uh they said they replied, let us get let us start rebuilding. So they began the good work. The good work was to restore the walls to was to to remove the disgrace, the reproach that Jerusalem uh, was uh, suffering under because of the sorry condition of the wall. And this was, again, a place where God himself had chosen to place his name. All right. The fact that uh, they had, uh, again, uh, that Nehemiah had mentioned that God was behind this, God uh, really strengthened their hands and their enthusiasm about the work. I want to read uh, uh, just a few sentences from a uh, an excerpt in from the Standard Commentary, uh, where it says Nehemiah realized he needed buy-in from Jerusalem's leadership 
to have success rebuilding the city wall, city's walls. Church leaders who ignore this principle do so at their own risk. A program or project will succeed only with the congregation's support. I spoke about that a few minutes ago. Uh, what does the health of your church's ministry say about the congregation's record on buy-ins? And what does that reveal in turn about prayer practices to get God's buy-in? We don't want the church to buy in anything that God is not in, anything that God has not bought in or God has not initiated or God is not leading us to do. So as I said earlier, we do want to get buy-in. Once you get buy-in, uh, and you want that to be unanimous to the extent possible, sure, there may be a few people that are against whatever it is you attempt, but if the majority uh, buy-in, it's going to be done if it's God's will. Okay, so now we're going to move into our third division from the quarterly, which is entitled Challenging the People. Challenging the People. And that's covered between chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me back up. I missed something. Um, that's what I just covered. I apologize. Uh, he's chal he challenged the people, and they responded, and they went to work. They got started on the good work. And, and again, a lot of reference was made to the good hand of God, and that was uh, a source of, of strength. Uh, for the task at hand and to make sure that the uh, the task would be successfully completed. Uh, the quarterly commentator mentions four, a four-step approach that Nehemiah used in gaining uh, public consensus or the buy-in we were talking about just a minute ago. He says, uh, and that demonstrated his uh, capable leadership skills. Number one, he fully uh, accessed and si uh, the size of the problem before addressing the people with his intentions. Okay, again, he did that night ride and, and, and assessed the situation. Number two, he identified himself as one of the people saying, let us rise up. And Bill. Now he's an outsider for all practical purpose, but he's a he's a Hebrew. Uh, he's a descendant of uh, the Jewish people that perhaps residents in Judah, if not Jerusalem, and so he's a part of God's heritage, and uh, he uh, it, 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 uh, of the covenant people. So he says, "Let us rise up and build." Number three, he presented an attainable goal that was both reasonable and practical. What he, again, he had already made provisions for materials. Uh, and, and as you read further into uh, Nehemiah, you see how the work is organized, who does what sections of the wall and so forth. And we know even when opposition comes, he has a, he, uh, with God's guidance, develops a plan for that. And he has uh, the, the men work close to their families and and of course, with a sword in one hand and a trial in the other, and, and they get the work done. And they get it done in, in record time, by the way. Uh, and then number four, uh, he motivated and encouraged the people by assuring them that God was with them. Now, you know, some of you may remember Moses, some of the conversation God and Moses had. And Moses said... Uh, or God said, you know, he was going to send his angel to uh, to go along with the people. And, and Moses said, you know, he said, Lord, I, if you don't go with us, I'm, I'm not going. <laughs> he said, if you know, you're not going to go with us through this wilderness, I, I'm not going. So uh, if God is with you, who can be against you? I mean, we, we, we read that throughout, throughout when, when God told uh, Joshua after Moses had died, 
you know, be strong and very courageous for the Lord thy God is with you, with us however thou goest. And the Lord Jesus told us the same thing. He, he, he would be with us always, even into the end of the world. So we want to make sure that as we go, we go in God's will. We go with God, or rather, God is certainly with us by virtue of his Holy, his Holy Spirit is with us, guiding us, empowering us to do his will. So, uh, moving on to the third division now, denouncing opposition. It's covered between Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Again, from the NIV, it reads, But when Sambalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, official uh, and or servant, if you will, the King James says, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We are his servants. Or it says, We his servants, rather, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Now, uh, we've read about uh, Sambalat, and uh, it's believed that he might have been uh, a descendant of the, the northern kingdom, but he was certainly not in fellowship with the Jews at Jerusalem. Uh, uh, and uh, read about him in, uh, in Ezra, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the opposition that he caused uh, and uh, he might have been from, uh, it says, a Horonite from uh, Beth Horon, which is about 12 miles from Jerusalem. Uh, and as I said, likely a part of the northern king, uh, tribes, a, a northern tribe at one point. But again, um, certainly not in fellowship with his Jewish brethren. Uh, and of course, the... Uh, uh, Tobiah, which in the uh, in the NIV it calls his name Tobiah, the Ammonite. Uh, he, uh, of course, we know uh, Ammon or the Ammonite that was on the east side of the Jordan River, and they had long been enemies of uh, the Jewish people, uh, and. Uh, he was related to, uh, by marriage, to someone in uh, one of Nehemiah's companions. We don't know who, I, I don't recall, but uh, a lot of things were kept kind of in secret for fear that he would find out. And he did find out about some plans through this relative uh, by marriage that he was related to. And then uh, the uh, the other... Gershom, the Arabian, uh, was uh, was one of the uh, Transjordan people that were doing a lot of trade uh, during the Persian period uh, uh, in that area. And, of course, the, he probably opposed anything that was going to obstruct or uh, cause any interference with his business dealings or his vested interests. Uh, and as I said, there was a lot of trade being go uh, going on uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the temple area in the in the city on the Sabbath day, which Nehemiah uh, strongly uh, resisted. We read about that again, I believe, in beginning in chapter four. So they mock, uh, not knowing anything about Nehemiah or the authority with which he held and came to Jerusalem with, they mocked. What are you gonna what are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? To build a wall uh was uh, suggested that a city intended to become independent, it intended to 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 form a defense, that means an army, uh and so forth. And so they didn't want anything to interfere with their access to that area or their people. Uh they didn't want any potential enemies or uh, uh, any resistance to, uh, as I said, 
their access to that people, to those people. So we get, we finally get to, and again, they ask again in ignorance, uh, are you rebelling against the king? And if you go back and read uh, Ezra, uh, boy, you read how the work uh, uh, was stopped uh, when um, uh, some false, some letter was written to Darius then uh, that was uh, suggested that they were going to rebel and this, that, and the other. And Darius stopped the work until uh, later on, but then now Artaxerxes is on the throne and he has uh, given uh, full authority to Nehemiah to do what he is doing and to be the civil governor of that area. They don't know who they're talking to, in other words. So uh, Nehemiah finally responds. He, and he says, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. Now, he doesn't start off by saying, you, do you know who you're talking to? Hey, look, look, these letters, look at these letters the king uh, sent me here with. The authority that he gave me. He does not start giving attributes to the king, but he gives it to where it rightfully belongs, the God of heaven. And he says he will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, in other words, you're not going to stop us. This is God's project. You're not going to stop. We are going to start rebuilding. We are his servants. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. They had no uh, basis for opposing uh, God's mission, what God had sent uh, uh, Nehemiah there to lead and, and, and his, his servants and intended for his servants to perform. Now in the King James Version, um, part B of verse 20 says, but ye have no portion nor right nor memorial in Jerusalem. And that, that word portion, translated portion, is used to refer to God's division of the promised land among the tribes of Israel. Uh, we can read examples of that in Joshua chapter 14, verse 4, 18, verse 5, and chapter 19, verse 9. Any portion Sambalat had had as an Israelite was revoked when God sent the ten northern tribes into exile for their faithlessness. We read about that in 2 Kings chapter 17. Verses 6 to 23. Now, in Ezra chapter 4, verse 3, you, you read where Ezra and others tell Sambalat that uh, they would have no part in rebuilding the temple, the house of their God, as well. Uh, they were going to do that. They, they didn't want that. They, they, they were saying, we'll help you, but they were pagans for the most part, or they certainly didn't know their God, and they didn't want them to have any part in doing that. Uh, and uh, the King James, that half verse says regarding the idea of a memorial, again, uh, <clears throat> this was historical, has historical ties to that, that area. They had no right to, they had no historical right to that area. That was, again, uh, part and parcel of uh uh, Judah, actually, and the faithful uh, worshipers uh, that had attended uh, the temple there. The northern kingdom had separated itself and established other worship places, uh, uh, had separated itself from Jerusalem and the temple, and therefore he had no historical basis for uh, being a part of anything they did there. And that's what... Uh, Nehemiah is making clear here in that last verse. Now, in summary, uh, our, our, our takeaways are we, we, we can see a clear example of good leadership in Nehemiah, good godly leadership in Nehemiah. Uh, care, the fact that he, he carefully planned, he assessed the situation. Uh, oftentimes, we want to... Uh, start speaking before we've even formulated clear clear thinking about a matter. We want to involve too many people who are likely to raise opposition, perhaps discourage others before we've tried to 
think through a matter and certainly discern whether it's God's will or not. Uh, and that's first That's first and foremost. We want to make sure that whatever we do as as godly leaders is in God's will. It's consistent with God's will. God's not always going to tell us specifically what we should do or what we shouldn't do, uh, certainly in terms of church projects. But he, what we do needs to be consistent with his will, with the guidance we find in his word. And certainly we need to pray fervently about it and for his guidance and his will and his uh, assistance, his power in, in performing whatever it is that we believe is God's will. So I hope we've learned a little more than perhaps we knew about uh, this uh, this part of Nehemiah. Again, as I said later on, uh, Nehemiah does uh, uh, he's not he's a civil leader. However, uh, he is uh, a, a a devout enough uh, servant of God to be offended by what he sees in the trafficking uh, of all kinds of merchandise uh, on the Sabbath day, and he puts an end to that. And and uh, But he accomplishes his mission. In fact, he returns to Susa, and he comes back. He serves two terms as governor, uh, uh, but ultimately he does return to Susa as he promised the king. So uh, we pray, again, that we've understood um, the example that God intended for us to in this word, and we pray... Um, that uh, he will continue to bless us with understanding of his word and with our obedience to uh, it. Again, the clear doctrinal teaching or teaching uh, and the examples that he provides in his word. So, Father, we do thank and praise you again. Again, we ask your blessings upon all the hearers and we ask your blessings upon the doers of your word. Keep us in your loving care until such time as we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.